Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Um, I'm just going to start with just micing up our speakers today. So I'll, um, I'll just tell you a little bit about what's going to happen this afternoon and um, what happens at the end. Um, so today we're delighted to welcome um, Philip Goff. Um, he'll be here to talk about his new book, Why, published by Oxford University Press. Um, Philip is a philosopher from Durham University and has a specialist focus on panpsychism. Uh, Philip and Philip. So Philip Holman also started discussing the philosophy of Philip Goffs via Twitter and this is how they got to know each other. So along with us obviously we have Sir Philip Holman today who needs no introduction. Um, he was awarded a CBE in 2019 for his services to literature. He's the author of of course his Dark Materials and many other books and recently last night he received the Bodley Medal at the Sheldonian Theatre presented by Richard Ovenden. Um, Nigel Warburton is a public philosopher, he's the author of A Little History of Philosophy, um, many very short introductions and numerous books. He's also the podcaster behind Philosophy Bites alongside David Edmonds. So please, ladies and gentlemen, give a very warm welcome to Philip Goff, Sir Philip Pullman and Nigel Warburton. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much. We're going to do this without microphones, so do wave if you can't hear us. Um, sorry? Am I here? Yeah, you're here. Go. This is real. <laughs> um, just in case. Uh, the simulation argument does feature in this book. Um, Okay, so I'm Nigel Warburton and I'm going to be interviewing and coordinating this. We're lucky to have two very eminent Philips, as I'm sure you already know. Um, the format for this is we're going to have a discussion between us and answer the question why. Once we've done that, there may be still some questions in your mind, so um, we're going to have about 20 minutes or so for questions. Everybody says this, but can you please keep them to short questions rather than long statements from the floor? Okay, thanks very much. Um, so let's begin with the obvious question. Um, what's this book about? Philip's book is called Why, but what's it about and why did you write it? Good question. So, yeah, I mean, it, I think it's a book I wouldn't have imagined myself writing five years ago. Actually. It's been quite a journey. Um, I think every, so many people in the West, at least, feel they have to fit into this dichotomy of either you believe in the God of traditional Western religion oh, you're a secular atheist. And I mean, I was raised Catholic actually and gave that up when I was 14, decided I didn't believe in God and was quite happily on team secular for a long time. Uh, didn't feel I had a God-shaped hole in my life as far as I was aware. But just, just slowly over the last five years ago, I've come to think that both of these worldviews are inadequate. You know, both of them have things they can't explain about reality. Both belief in the traditional God and the secular atheist view of a sort of meaningless, purposeless universe. And where I've come to think the evidence and the arguments point is to some kind of purpose or goal directedness at the fundamental level of reality, but in the absence of the traditional God of Western religion. And that's what this book's about. So that that's quite um, an interesting position to take as a conventional philosopher. The majority of the philosophers I know go with Hume, Darwin, and believe that pre-Darwin perhaps it was difficult to see how apparent design in the universe um, could have arisen without there being an omniscient creator or something like this. But post-Darwin, you have an impersonal mechanism. So you're trying to do something that is sort of post-Darwin, it seems to me, that say, look, actually, we need to learn from the science as we learn from Darwin's scientific observations and theories and, and go with what the evidence is pointing to now. And it's not what it was in, the, in most of the 20th century. Yeah, I, I guess I feel like, or maybe at the start of the scientific revolution, everyone believed in God and God even played a bit of a role in Newton's theory, giving the planets a bit of a nudge every now and again to keep them in stasis. Um, then maybe as time goes on, God starts to look more and more redundant from physics. Um, we have a famous uh, French physicist Laplace who worked out a way of removing God from Newton's physics. And a uh, famous anecdote when um, 
Napoleon read Laplace's work and said, where's God in this? And Laplace said, I, sire, I have no need of that hypothesis, allegedly. Um, but, yeah, but before Darwin, you still seem to have evidence for um, God or apparent design in, in the complex functioning of organisms. But as you say, post Darwin, even that seemed to be removed. And then I think at that point we do, for over a hundred years, there is no evidence for God or anything Godish or cosmic purpose. And we do get this mindset that science has ruled out anything like that. Maybe even that science and spirituality are opposed. I, I happen to think from the 70s onwards, the evidence starts to change. Particularly something I guess we'll get onto, the fine tuning of physics for life. And I now think we're in a period where we're in a bit of a, a bit of denial about this. It's maybe like in the 17th century where we first started getting evidence that we're, we're not in the center of the universe and people struggled to accept that because it didn't fit with the picture of reality they'd got used to. And nowadays we kind of scoff at them and think, oh, those stupid religious people, why didn't they just follow the evidence? But I think every generation absorbs a worldview they can't see beyond. And I think we've got so used to this mindset of, oh no, science has ruled out purpose that as the evidence has changed, as I think it has to support cosmic purpose, it maybe takes time for the culture to catch up with that. So we'll, we'll come back to what you could possibly mean by God in that context, and also what you mean by purpose as well, which is very important. Um, but I'd like to bring the other Philip in. Um, my question is, why are you here now? Why are you here in this discussion um, with um, somebody putting forward an idea which, on the face of it, is antithetical to many things that you've said in public? Um, well, you shouldn't take too um, seriously what authors say in public. We, we, <laughs> we, we say these things on the spur of the moment and then deny it afterwards. It's, it's really, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not... The, th the things you say in a public event are not the same sort of things you would say in a in a philosophy seminar or, a, you know, to a group of experts in a particular subject. So it's, it's, it's different. Yes, I have said I'm an atheist, but the reason that I say that is that I haven't seen any evidence for God in the world that I'm in. Um, but simultaneously, I know that the world that I'm in and everything I know about the world and everything I could find out about the world, wherever I look, is the most tiny pinprick of light in the huge vast encircling darkness in which there might be anything. There might be God out there, there might be all sorts of monsters and demons and heaven knows what. Um, so I, I know these two things simultaneously by changing the perspective. But I'm very interested um, in Philip's idea, for the one for which he's best known perhaps, which is that of panpsychism. He can explain it far better than I can. But it's to do with the presence of consciousness. And um, what do we mean by consciousness? What do we mean by awareness? I've always sort of felt, um, rather than thought, I've felt that one of the purposes of my life would be to extend the amount of consciousness in the universe. It's a bit of a grandiose thing to say, but um, I'm very much on the side of those people who are extending our consciousness by telling us things, discovering things, um, making things plain and Philip Goff is a wonderful example of this because in his book um, Galileo, Galileo's Error, Galileo's Error um, he talks about that period in our intellectual history when consciousness was kind of quietly shown the door. Uh, we didn't need, as Galileo pointed out, we didn't need anything more than numbers to explain the universe and everything around us. Um, I'd never seen that put so clearly and so um, so vividly before as in that book. That's why I started reading uh, Philip Goff. And uh, this, this new book is an extension of that uh, uh, original insight to me and fascinating. Yeah, I'd like to support the idea that Philip is one of the clearest philosophy writers we have at the moment. And we're very fortunate in, in his ability to explain actually quite complex ideas yes. and make them seem straightforward and it's not straightforward necessarily because some of them are quite exotic but certainly understandable um, you feel you under you can get a grasp of them but also see how they might apply it's not just some kind of um, 
abstract discussion of interest, like solving crossword puzzles, it has real, all, all the things he says have real implications for life. So that's, that's yeah. admirable. I have to say at the same time that I am probably in his eyes, um, stuck in the teenage phase of subjectivism and scepticism about, that's about right, um, religion and God. Um, but that's my problem, not yours. Um, so, so um, Philip, you, you've talked about Philip as a writer and your interest in panpsychism. What about in this particular book? I mean, he's asking the question why and getting to the really big questions that philosophers don't often discuss about what the meaning of life or purpose of life could yeah. possibly be. Does that resonate with you particularly? Very much. Um, when, I, when I was a teenager, I was very struck by existentialism or what I could find out about it. It seemed to consist of smoking gaulois and wearing a black polo neck sweater and that sort of thing. And it was all rather sexy and fun. Um, but what it did was to uh, make clear to me that we are responsible for a lot of what we do and what happens. It's not up to anybody else. It's not up to this uh, absent God. Um, it's, it's up to us. We have to, um, how do they put it? Existence comes before essence. No, essence comes before, no, existence, existence before precedes essence. essence. Precedes yeah. essence. Yeah. In other words, we don't, we're not born with a lot of um, uh, assumptions and, 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 and predispositions and so on. But we have to create ourselves out of the, the bare fact of our own existence. And I quite like that. So that was where I come from. Um, uh, I won't say philosophically, it wasn't anything near, near as grand as that, but that's where I come from in terms of feeling. But also um, a big, big part of what made me was poetry, especially the poetry of the English Romantics, Wordsworth and so on. And from them, I had a sense that the world is actually full of life. It's alive, something far more deeply interfused, as Wordsworth puts it, I think, in uh, Tintin Abbey. Um, and so Philip's notion that consciousness pervades everything and is in fact the, the ground on which everything else exists was very very attractive to me it, it made sense it made sense in an emotional as well as intellectual way so at the core of your book is the fine-tuning argument could you sketch out what that is mm. i mean just for people who may not have heard of it and probably many of the people in the room know something about the fine-tuning argument it's an argument for the existence of God, it's a form of design argument, but it's got a particular scientific twist. Mm. So just, I mean, just taking a step back, first of all, I suppose what I'm saying is the th there are things that traditional belief in God can't explain. There are things that traditional atheism can't explain. Just to briefly reference the, the, the problems with the God hypothesis or the familiar ones of reconciling a loving or powerful God with the terrible suffering we find in the world. Maybe we could get onto that or maybe not. But in terms of the things that uh, traditional atheism can't explain, by which I mean the conviction that there's a meaningless, purposeless universe, this is, as you say, Nigel, the fine tuning of physics, which is discovery of recent decades that for life to be possible, certain numbers in physics had to fall in a certain very narrow range. So perhaps the example that's most baffled cosmologists revolves around dark energy, which is the, uh, I know Philip likes dark matter, uh, dark energy is the force that pushes apart the universe. We discovered in 1998, the universe isn't only expanding, it's accelerating. So physicists postulate this force that's pushing things apart. Now, once you do the calculations, it becomes apparent that if that force had been just a little bit stronger, everything would have been pushed apart so quickly that no two particles would have ever met. We wouldn't have had stars, planets, any kind of structural complexity whatsoever. Whereas if it had been significantly weaker, it wouldn't have counteracted gravity. And so the whole universe would have collapsed back on itself a split second after the Big Bang. So to get any kind of life or structured complexity, the strength of this force has to be like Goldilocks porridge, just right, you know, not too strong, not too weak. Um, as you say, Nigel, some people use it as an argument for God. God's fixed the numbers to get human beings. You might think that's a bit anthropocentric. But I don't think you have to take this in a God direction. As I say, I think that's got problems too. Fundamentally, just to sum it up, I think we, we, we face a dilemma. Either it's just an incredible fluke that these numbers in physics are just right for life. And that's just one example. There are many others. 
And that seems to me too improbable to take seriously if we think about some of the incredible probabilities at play here. Or the num those numbers in our physics are as they are because they are the right numbers for life. In other words, that there's some kind of goal-directedness towards life in this very early stages of the universe, and that's what I mean by cosmic purpose, which is weird, but we should put aside our biases, both religious and secular, and just try and follow where the evidence seems to be leading. Look, my wife once left her phone in a taxi in London, and the taxi driver picked it up, it was open, and he called home and rang me, and, and said, I found your wife's phone in the taxi. I said, okay, I'm coming to London tomorrow. I'm not sure when I'm gonna finish, but when I've done that, I'll call you up, and um, I'll pay the taxi fare from wherever you are. I came out of where I was, um, a, a gallery where I was working and, and was on the old Brompton Road, called him up and he stopped. He was, he was like 10 yards from me oh with giving somebody a ride That's who wouldn't believe purpose. what had just happened. <laughs> and it, it affected me quite strongly. But ultimately, rationally, I think that was just a fluke. Um, you know, who's to say we, we are the kind of creatures who want to find meaning in coincidences, yeah. uh, things that happen. Who's to say that we aren't just the result of a fluke? There's mind-numbingly small odds, but that's just the way it is. We wouldn't, there wouldn't be a question for anybody unless we existed. We are just this phenomenon that's occurred and we just have to take it that it is a fluke. Who's to yeah. say that, what, at what point can you say it can't be a fluke? I mean, there are all sorts of things that are a bit improbable and, you know, you're thinking of someone on their phone that maybe we were happy to think is coincidence because it's not that improbable. Um, I give the example in the book of Jesus in toast. If you Google Jesus on toast. That's quite probable <laughs> in my experience of toast. <laughs> you know, you get this birthmark, birthmark, burn mark uncannily like Jesus or Jesus in Western art, I guess. And But it's, you know, it's kind of a bit improbable perhaps. And so that's why it's entertaining, but it's not that improbable. But when it comes to, I think it passes a point where it's so improbable that's no longer a rational option. I mean, and surely we all agree there are such examples. If you imagine burglars break into a bank and there's a 10 digit combination on the safe and they get it right first time, <laughs> nobody would say, oh, maybe they just fluked it. You know, no. Well, what, else, what, what else would they say though? Actually, in that example, what else could you possibly say? In that example, <laughs> There's no other plausible explanation for me, given the, the presumptions that I have, that they've not got some kind of telepathic powers to, to, to be able to tell what the... the but I'm saying you, you wouldn't think they just guessed it, right? Well, I would. You think they just, just guessed unlikely, it? It's just but they're just no, you a think, fluke. Surely, surely the rational thing to think is that, you know, they knew somehow, they had an ins someone on the inside that told oh, them... Oh, the, the way number. you set it up, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, maybe I told the story wrong. Um, I'm just saying, it, all, all we know is that they that they did get the combination right. Yeah, you look for the most plausible and, explanation. Yeah, I think it would, n nobody would say, oh, they just, it's just too improbable. So we would look for, I mean, another example I give in the book. So I think these, are, these probabilities, because it's sort of abstract physics, you know, it's hard to make concrete. And so you think, oh yeah, it could be a fluke. But I mean, take for example, you know, you roll a dice. I think I, we can say dice now, can't we, rather than die. I think language has changed. <laughs> um, you're the expert on that. Uh, you know, and it just comes up six, 70 times in a row, right? Again, I think you'd say, you wouldn't say, oh, well, there you go. You'd say the dice is fixed or, you know, what you call yeah, it. Yeah, but then you check and it and it's not. And then it's just, what other explanation can there be that it's a fluke? You're saying, well, it could be some kind of purposeful organization of the universe that made it such. But, I mean, but what's the, that's not evidence, that's just a, a commitment of intuitions in a different direction. Well, in a way, so one thing that's fortunate about the time we're living in now is that we do have something called Bayes' theorem, which is um, a piece of mathematics that tells us precisely how evidential support works. And so in a way, I mean, it's, there's still debatable things about this argument, but it's not just a random appeal to intuitions. We can... Uh, apply this bit of mathematics and, and to my mind a straightforward application does on the face of it look like um, the fine-tuning supports cosmic purpose but come back straight back to your point rather than getting into all those complexities um, yeah I mean look if we can 
rule out all possibilities. It's hard to know how we do that with the dice or the burglars. Then we'd have to say, Jesus, that's a, just an incredible fluke. But when you have those things that are so improbable, if there is an alternative to chance, then that is very rationally supported. Okay, so what's the alternative? Uh, and, and, there, and there is, um, so I think this, cos this, goal, this cosmic purpose idea is something we can make sense of as a hypothesis. I'll explain why. And I think the only reason we resist it, I think, are cultural reasons. It, it feels weird. It's not what we're used to at this particular period of history. Okay, so but, let, let's get clear. Cosmic yeah. purpose. Like when we use the word purpose, we usually think of a mind with intentions and doing something purposeful. Yeah. That's not exactly what you're suggesting, is it? That it's or it's something built into the structure of the universe rather than a, a conscious mm. mind doing stuff intentionally. So I, I consider a range of hypotheses, a range of possibilities. This is a exploration. So that perhaps the most straightforward way of resolving this, accounting for both suffering and fine-tuning, is just tweaking God's characteristics a bit. So maybe the designer, maybe there's a designer of our universe who's bad or amoral <clears throat> or of limited abilities and has just made the best universe she can and she's like, I know it's going to be messy, I'm sorry, this is the best I can do. Or maybe the simulation hypothesis I consider as well, associated with Nick Bostrom or David Chalmers has a recent book on it. Maybe we're in a computer simulation and our creator is some random software engineer in the next universe up. But, as you said, Nigel, so that's the first hypothesis, a sort of non-standard designer. But it's not obvious that we do need some kind of conscious mind to underpin cosmic purpose. The philosopher Thomas Nagel has explored in great detail the possibility of what he calls teleological laws. Laws of nature with purposes built into them. So it might just be a sort of impersonal tendency towards life at the fundamental level, which interacts with the known laws of physics in a way we don't fully understand it yet. yet. So that's a, another possibility. And just finally, the third hypothesis that I probably think has the edge and relates to my previous work on panpsychism that Philip has referred to, I explore the possibility, cosmopsychism, that the universe itself is a conscious mind with its own goals and purposes. So I think there are these ways of making sense of cosmic purpose, which is strongly empirically supported, in my view, by the evidence of fine tuning. I don't think there's any incoherence or improbability about these hypotheses. They just seem weird. <laughs> but who, can, you know, who cares what's weird? And um, so that's what we should go for. Oh, did you want to come in? Well, when it comes to dice, I can't help remembering the, um, the, the, the big Julie character from Guys and Dolls who um, was, a, was a, a, a famous gambler and he had a blank dice and they said, where are the spots? He said, I have the spots removed for luck. <laughs> and they said, but how do you know what number's uppermost? He said, I remember where the spots formerly were. <laughs> so <laughs> could it not be that the, um, the, the character who's running the dice is in fact malicious? You see, when we talk about a, go a goal and, and a purpose-driven universe, we kind of assume that's a good thing. Could it be a bad thing? It could we be could. the playthings of a, a, a gigantic immortal Chicago gangster? Yeah. <laughs> well, so the first thing I would say is there is obviously a great deal of uncertainty. <laughs> um, I do think there's evidence for some kind of cosmic purpose, but there's a great deal of uncertainty. But in terms of the bad designer hypothesis, I actually think, and the philosopher Stephen Law has defended this very well, that it's not very good either because it faces the mirror image problems of the good God hypothesis. If you've got a good God, why is there all the suffering? Why? Wasn't that the point though, that it was yeah. supposed to undermine the God hypothesis in general rather than be support for there actually being a bad God? Yeah, I'm not so persuaded by, well, I mean, I, I'm very persuaded by the problem of evil more generally. I'm not, I'm a little bit uncertain about Stephen North's particular take on that. But what I think he is right about is, for that reason, the bad God hypothesis is no good. Because then you'd have to wonder, why did, why are all the nice things? I mean, to my mind, I, I think the universe as we find it is a mixture of accident and design. There are things that are too improbable to be chance, like the fine tuning, also certain things about consciousness and the evolution of consciousness I point to in the book. But there are some things that, s that seem pretty clearly gratuitous and arbitrary and, um, you know, 
So I think we need a hypothesis that can accommodate both. The, the, the bad God hypothesis has a, has a long history, of course. It's, behind, it's what lay behind the idea of Gnosticism. The Gnostic idea was yeah. that this universe, the physical, physical universe that we can see and, and move about in, is the creation of a, a demiurge, a bad God. And inside each of us, there's a little spark of true divinity. And our task as individuals is to look after that spark and escape from this malevolent universe where people get ill and there are crocodiles and there are burglars and thieves and, and so on, uh, back to the infinitely distant God out there. This is a very attractive idea at certain times in history, it seems to me. It was very attractive at the end of the, sort of end of the Roman Empire. It was also very attractive around the millennium. Um, we had programs like The X-Files, The Truth is Out There, and The Truman Show, where you know, he's caught up in a universe that's entirely false and he has to get, his, get out of it. It's an attractive idea that keeps coming back. Mm. But um, you, you, you weren't tempted that way. I guess I think it's not the most plausible hypothesis. I think, well, the simulation hypothesis, might be, because we need to explain, yeah, I just think we need to explain both why there's the good things and there's the bad things. And another option is the, um, oh, what was the religion of St. Augustine before he converted? Manichaeism. Manichae Manichaeanism. Kind of I, I gave a talk yeah. before, while I was still writing the book and someone said, uh, what about Ma Manichaean? I can't pronounce it. So I talk about that a little bit. And, but again, you'd have to have, what, what are the exact... This is the How, idea that the good and evil oh yeah, are in a sorry. perpetual struggle. There's a good God and, and good a bad tends God. to get the upper so hand from time to time. I think these, always... these hypotheses end up getting a little bit complicated and, uh, and improbable. I think, I think the idea of, of a, a, good, a good God of limited capacities is actually a bit simpler. Just say the limitations are just what corresponds to physics. And, but, um, but yeah, as I say, I think overall, I think cosmopsychism looks to be the most, to my mind, Sounds a bit extravagant, but the most probable hypothesis. It fits with what I think is an independently plausible view of consciousness. Why postulate a designer, a supernatural designer outside of the universe, whether good or bad, if it makes sense, and I would argue it does, that the universe itself is some kind of very alien mental entity. Is that more or less what Spinoza's God was. I'm not sure if Spinoza's God was meant to be consciousness, but conscious. But um, he talks about God or nature, yes. and effectively got ex the Jewish equivalent of being ex excommunicated as a result um, because he said he said that God is just nature, and that's the God that Einstein was happy to believe yeah. in as an atheist. And I, I think I, I would buy that if you don't have to buy the consciousness bit, um, which that's just is another form of atheism, really. We're not saying that there's anything beyond yeah. what we are and what exists as the material world. Um, we're, we're not saying there's heaven, we're not saying there's hell. We're saying that when, pe when we talk about this life force and the way the universe is all um, interrelated, we might as well be talking about it as God. This is the, thing, the reason why we're here. Um, and, and that's all that we have. We don't have a personal God. We don't have stuff that gives much for religion to get going on. Yeah, I so, mean... So this is building up to the big question because we've only got five minutes before we open it up, which is <laughs> why are we here? And how does all this oh, relate to morality yeah. about how we treat each other? Because you do connect those things, and it's, it's really ambitious and admirable that you're taking on these big questions Rule of hardy. philosophy. But but it, I, I think it'd be really useful. To, yeah. Sorry, I think it'd be really useful to to just sketch out something about what you think the meaning of life is. That's a huge question. Mm. But in four minutes, <laughs> why do we exist? Right. Well, you have to buy the book if you want to find out. Yeah, no. Um, so most of the book is just the cold-blooded scientific philosophical argument for this position and you know what I'm most driven by I just really want curious about the nature of reality and we'll never know for certain but want to have try and have our best guess as to what reality is like so you could <coughs> my colleague David Faraci you know talking about fine-tuning says hey, I think you've got a reasonable case there but I don't care you know I'll just make my own meaning it doesn't matter to me and you could accept most of the book and not think it has an influence on life but in the final chapter, I do consider the implications of cosmic purpose for human life and meanings, spiritual practice, communities, even political struggle. And overall, I, it's always the middle ways for me. I always, 
hate the dichotomy. So I pursue us. I defend a kind of middle way here. So at one extreme, you've got the Christian philosopher William Lane Craig, who says, if there's no point to the universe, it's all pointless. He says, we might as well rape and kill each other. You know, it's just all the pointless. And um, not only religious people, the anti-natalist philosopher David Benatar thinks it's immoral to have children because partly because life is too meaningless, so we should let the human race pass out of existence. Anyway, the other extreme, a familiar humanist position, um, my colleague David Ferracci I just referred to, this probably isn't cosmic purpose, but if there is, it doesn't matter, right? So I, I defend a middle way view, I think, we can have perfectly meaningful lives, independent of cosmic purpose, through pursuing kindness, creativity, the pursuit of knowledge. I think, like to think I had quite a meaningful life before I got interested in cosmic purpose. But, that was a bit loud, wasn't it? But, um, if there is some plausibility to cosmic purpose, there's perhaps the potential for a more meaningful life, you know, I think we so want... So what's the added value? We, the, the, what's think, that extra? I think we want our lives to make a difference. If you can potentially contribute in some tiny way to the purposes of the whole of reality, that's huge. That's about as, as so bad a So we're expanding the mind can, of God. When we, so when Philip project. does the kind of things which he does brilliantly, um, both as a writer and a champion of reading and, and writing and libraries, he's expanding, literally expanding the mind of God for you. I would say it's sort of, well, it depends which hypothesis. That's an interesting way of putting expanding the mind of God. I, I suppose it's expanding the ethical project. So, you know, what's a typical humanist picture is, well, we're trying to improve life for human beings on this earth. Or some people talk now about sentientism, trying to improve prove life for sentient beings. I think pretty much everything sentient is a bit tricky. Um, I suppose the cosmic purposivist view is that it's an even broader ethical project that the good projects we're pursuing here are part of a all-encompassing ethical scheme of the whole of reality. And, um, you know, I don't want to be dogmatic about the one true way of having a meaningful life. But I suppose I have found this in my experience of the last few years to be a meaningful way of framing one's existence yeah. in, in a broader context. Stops me thinking so narrowly about my own interests, keeps my ego in check. So I suppose what I'm interested to do in this book is, you know, perhaps invite people to consider this option that's not the familiar religious option or humanist option. And I don't know, maybe you might get something out of it. So God is not quite there yet, but he's showing promise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose um, the idea is there is a directedness towards some greater reality that has, you know, that has already brought about life, intelligent life, conscious beings which understand yeah. the universe around them, can contemplate their own existence. It could be that's the end of it, right? That's all folks, as Porky Pig used to say. But once you believe in cosmic, if you accept, believe is a very strong word, but you take seriously the idea of cosmic purpose, you might think it's a bit improbable that, oh, we happen to be living at the final culmination of it. So maybe it's more likely that there is, it is still unfolding in ways we don't fully understand. There will be a greater form of reality of life or consciousness as unfathomable to us as our existence is to ants. And, you know, to some extent, just finally, and I want to I know, Philip, what you think about this stuff <laughs> and the meaning of life more generally. Um, you know, I, 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 I love the f 19th century psychologist and philosopher William James, who said oh, that yeah. to an extent, it can, to an extent, limited extent, it can be rational to hope beyond the evidence. We only live once, and if you can find a, a hope to live in that gives meaning and motivation to your life, then that's okay, even if you lack certainty to a very great degree. What do you think, Philip? The meaning? I think it's simply more interesting to live like that. Good a reason as any. It's um, <clears throat> yeah. It's it, it it's 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 a richer way of living. It's a richer way of feeling and thinking. It um, it allows us to do that thing which is commanded in the Christian Church as um, one of the virtues, um, hope. And I, I like reminding people that hope is not just a temperament; it's a duty. 
it's a virtue. And this gives us a reason for doing that and, and a, a justification for being hopeful, if you like, um, against the likelihood, that, against the possibility that the universe is just a dice with the spots taken off. <laughs> On that note, let's open this up for questions. Um, OK. Um, can we have your question? You have to speak up so people can hear at the back, but I'll repeat the question anyway. Um, I I'm very struck with the parallel of the ideas you're expressing and those of Ian McGilchrist, mm -hmm. um, wh whose magisterial <clears throat> synthesis of neuroscience and philosophy actually comes to what seems to me some similar conclusions in, in, in some aspects. And I know that Bullman is a, an admirer of his work. Indeed, yeah. And so I'd be very interested in both your reflections on the parallels with his ideas and your own. Okay, so qu the question is about um, parallels with the work of Ian um, Any particular book? Uh, well, I, I would say his latter one, particularly The Matter With Things, but also his preceding one, The, the Master, Master and His Emissary. So the Master and His Emissary was the one that really set out his stool, wasn't but it? His later one, the dense one, it, which is denser and, and fuller, I, I think... OK, so any parallels with um, Miguel Christ? Well, I, I would have asked that myself if we'd, um, you know, if we'd had an infinite amount of time. I find that parallel very interesting. Um, McGill Christ's approach is to look at the d difference between the right and the left hemispheres of the brain, which lends itself to a lot of popular writing about how you can draw better if you do, use your left hand and all that sort of stuff. He's way beyond, way above that. It's to do with the, um, the different ways of perceiving the world and our position in it that are characteristic, he says, of the left brain versus the right brain. And I've often wondered whether this sort of maps onto other great divisions such as um, uh, classic and romantic or um, William Blake's innocence and experience or William James's once born and twice born. These are ways of, ways of looking at experience and um, making a kind of sense of it. Yeah, no, it's a very good question. I mean, I'm a huge fan of his earlier work. I haven't yet tackled this new book, but somebody was telling me last night a very s similar thing about the potential connections here. And um, yeah, I think there's more of a movement. Um, there are scattered around a small number of books and works that aren't these two familiar options of traditional religion and secular atheism. And, you know, say, I was just saying last night in the, in the, in the event for Philip Pullman, um, you know, I think a lot of the public do class themselves as in some way spiritual but not religious. And yet academics and artists perhaps don't often cater for that grouping. <laughs> and, and then we get the idea that, oh, it's just sort of fluffy thinking. But I think that's just an accidental circumstance of um, that work hasn't been put into it. So I'm quite passionate about making rigorous scientific philosophical sense to this middle ground options and seeing where it leads and well maybe i'll just have to have a promise you note that to, to look into in mcgillchris new book and i want to try and get him on my podcast mind chat a quick plug and uh love to, i'd love to have a conversation with him and thank you another question yeah um today's event and uh, and perhaps your book uh, philip as, as well uh respectfully um may suggest that there is uh, a living to be uh, made from answering such questions as uh, why and searching for the meaning of life. Uh, can you not consider that perhaps there are lots and lots of people in this world uh, who don't want to ask that question or don't feel the need to ask the question? They're very busy living yeah. quite difficult lives. They're, they're trying to, you know, today they're trying to survive um they're maybe too busy and uh the the answers that you've been discussing this today uh, are very much determined by the question why you know the, mm -hmm. the title of your book and that maybe we could ask a different question and i'd like to suggest uh why why okay this is a meta question <laughs> um, why why summarized in the last it could have been three, two words in a sense that question why why in the sense that um, the question was, asked, was, was asking, was pointing out that some people can make a living from 
I don't know if you can make a living from this, but you can certainly um, supplement your income from asking the question why in public, and in the big sense of why are we here. But for many people, um, busy or under stress, that's a luxury. Um, so why, why? It's a very good question. You might think this is sort of bourgeois indulgence. There was so. a hint of that, wasn't there, in the question? And that's fine. Yeah. And I don't mind. Do feel honest. And, and questions do feel free to. Uh, object strongly. I'm used to that. Uh, um, I mean, I would say two things. I mean, firstly, I'm paid to be a philosopher by my university and I'm, my job is trying to have our best guess at the nature of reality. I suppose you might think that's a waste of time, but well, is art a waste of time? Is novel writing a waste of time? Is, is science that's not Pra totally practical a waste of time. I suppose I think, who was it who said it during the war? What are we fighting for? If, you know, w as human beings, we don't just try and get the bare necessities of life as important as they are. And of course, there's a lot of suffering we need to address in the world, but we try to see reach beyond that for these noble endeavors of culture and art and philosophy and trying to guess at what reality is like. Um, and I'd lose my job if I just said, if I, <laughs> but it's uh, stronger than that even, isn't it? Because in those times of great stress, people are actually drawn to philosophy. I know, I th well, that was going to be my second point. I think, I think, look, I mean, I talk about politics and in the book and the desire to make the world better. I suspect at least for some people, they will find more motivation for doing that more um, hope and motivation by encompassing it in a broader picture of a, a sense, a hope of what the purpose of existence is. Some people might not, might be a temperamental thing. Um, so then, yeah, so I don't think in that sense, in that sense, it can perhaps have real world practical importance. Often with philosophy, things do have, you know, real world spin-offs. Bayes' theorem was the Reverend Thomas Bayes trying to respond to Hume's arguments against miracles and turned into this bit of maths that is very useful for tracking the pandemic and uh, dominates the predictive processing paradigm in neuroscience. So often blue sky thinking does have these very real world practical implications. Do you want to add? Well, I was just going to say it's Y because Elon Musk had already bagged X. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still waiting for Z to come along. And Omega. Yeah. Um, yes. So um, just two, two challenges and opportunity. It, it strikes me it's, it's not improbable that mm. something improbable will happen. Mm. The time was, I guess, one in 14 million sperm at one point. Um, it's true. not improbable that somebody is born that was one in 14. It's just improbable that it happened. OK, just, to, just to, in case you're struggling to hear this, he's saying it's not improbable that something improbable should happen. Uh, he points out that he was a one in 40 million um, hit with a sperm. That's why he's here. And yeah. like, well, presumably why all of us are here. Yeah, it's just it? improbable that that specific one is selected. Yeah. And similarly, our meaning and purpose, sort of human constructs to begin with, rather than something that's intrinsic in the universe. Mm. But does this sort of segue to an opportunity in the, you know, I, I don't know if you can consider consciousness as something that might be considered as separate to the contents of consciousness that we understand through meaning and language. Um, have you looked at, for example, the sort of Vedic or ancient Indian philosophy of be there being a shared awareness and the universe waking up to itself? And could that be the route to expanding the mind of God? For so this is in part, a quote, well, I think the main part of this question is actually uh, um, about the possibility of finding resonances in Vedic philosophy, the idea of consciousness waking up to itself, which is also there in Hegel, I think, somewhere allegedly, not that I understand Hegel. Um, yeah, both great questions. So on the first one, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm glad you asked that. And I, I should say, actually, the, the book, my first book was an academic book. My second book was aimed at general audience. This is trying to do both. So each chapter has a more accessible introduction and then, well, more than an introduction, accessible part, and then a digging deeper bit, which goes into all the technical details and tries to cover all possible objections, including this one, so, and, and I hope it is a, a very accessible introduction to Bayesian reasoning, which 
you don't often find. But yeah, so I think you're, you're totally right. And, and it goes beyond what was covered in the, the, the discussion between me and Nigel earlier. Uh, yeah, some things are improbable, but it's not improbable that they're improbable. And some things are improbable, and it is improbable that they're improbable. What's the difference? So we can give examples, right? I think the, the, um, the bank robbers just happening to guess the right code, I think we'd say, no, no, that's, it. that's not only improbable, but it's improbable that it's improbable. But so what's the difference? Um, well, let me give a different example. Um, so suppose you've got a random number generator that spits out some totally random number like 7962410, you know. That's part of pi, isn't it? Oh, is that? Sorry, <laughs> have I accidentally given? <laughs> I've accidentally. Um, now, it's improbable that it should give that exact number, but we don't think that needs explaining. Whereas suppose for decades there has been a cult that worships that particular number, and moreover, they predict that it's going to, the random number jet, computed number generator is going to sp spit out that precise number and that precise thing. Now, now that needs explaining because that, 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 that number that's come out has a significance independently of it being the particular outcome. So whether improbable thing needs, things need explaining depends on whether the outcome has a significance independently of it just having to, happening to be the outcome. Um, so I think with the fine tuning, yeah, in a sense, whatever numbers that come up in our physics, it would be improbable that it's those exact numbers. But I think there is a special significance to the numbers that did come up. I think what is striking that um, the numbers that came up in our physics allow for a universe containing great value. Life, intelligent life, people that can fall in love and write novels and contemplate their existence. Whereas as far as we can map out the possibility space, most of the other numbers you could generate, the universes have little or no value. Many of them, you just have hydrogen, the simplest element, one chemical interaction, um, or, the, or the universe, you know, collapsing back on itself or particles never meeting. So I think that is why this needs explaining. It's not just that it's improbable, but that, that the number that came up has this significance that it corresponds to a universe containing value. And I think that's why it needs explaining. Um, briefly on the second point, yeah, there's a very good Australian philosopher, Miri Albahari, who's developed a sort of conception of reality rooted in an advaita Vedanta mysticism. And it's wonderful that our tradition of analytic philosophy, which was known to be very scientific and logical, and it is very, very analytic and logical. And, but out of that tradition, there's now a much wider diversity of views being defended. And she defends this view in this very rigorous analytic way. She argues that we should treat expert meditators as, um, as a form of expertise and that has epistemological credibility. Um, I'm a bit uncertain. I talk about this a little bit in Galileo's Error, a little bit in this book as well, Mysticism. And I suppose one thing I worry about is I, I, I ran a conference on panpsychism recently and we had a Hindu monk philosopher and he was saying himself, the problem with relying on mystical experiences is there's a diversity of mystical experiences in, in, you know, in different traditions. People interpret it in a different way in Hindu, Hinduism, in Buddhism, in Christianity, in Judaism and so on. So I definitely think there's some phenomenon there to take seriously. But how exactly we understand the idea of oneness or whatever can vary in different traditions. So it's a little bit difficult to know what to make of it. Look, I'm conscious. Oh, great. Because I was going to say, we're a manal and we've only had questions from men so far. So let's have this question. Yeah. Until five past? We start oh, yeah, definitely go to five past if that's OK. Well, you don't, if you need to leave desperately, please feel free at four o'clock. But um, we started late, so we're going to carry on a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, I've got two questions. Oh, I don't know if I can allow That's like. They're very related. OK. <laughs> well, he had two, so fair enough. I have read your book, and this is a slightly technical question, but I was wondering what your preferred way of responding to the problem of old evidence is mm. Bayesian formula. But I will maybe let you explain what that means. I... So that's the first question is, how does he respond to the problem of old evidence within the Bayes theorem um, context, mm -hmm. which is a technical question, which he's going to explain. The second? And then the second question, sort of question, 
is I, is I understand the monism and a kind of Schopenhauerian idea of oneness, such that if you do ill, you do ill to yourself, because mm. everything's one, and so it's rational on some level, um, is very morally expedient. But I'm not entirely clear how you get from fine tuning. Okay, so the second part of the question has got a Schopenhauerian spin. I mean, Schopenhauer, I think I'm right um, in saying so that violence is like a snake biting its own tail. Um, there's a sense in if everything's one, then you do harm to other people, you're doing harm to each other. Um, but he wasn't sure how you get from fine tuning to that kind of moral consequence. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So the two questions. Old evidence is the issue whereby so you, we tend to think of Bayesian reasoning as what we call updating, that you get new evidence and that updates your beliefs, as, i.e. changes them on the basis of that evidence. Whereas if you think, what, okay, how do I update from the proposition that our universe allows for life? Because we always knew that, right? It's not, it's not, it's not something new and so not something we can sort of update our beliefs on because we already knew it. So that's the old evidence challenge. I guess I just think, I guess I've never been too impressed with this challenge. I suppose I think that's a way of thinking about Bayesian reasoning as a sort of abstract thing, but it's nothing sort of special about when you got the evidence. So the example I give in the book, actually, um, now I'm not gonna remember it precisely, but Einstein v. Newton, uh, we have this data that the precession of the perihelium of Mercury, which is the perihelium is what, how close you are to the, su the the closest bit to the sun in your orbit, and that changes. So that's the precession of the perihelium of the planet Mercury. Now, Einstein got that bang on with general relativity. Newton was a little bit off, right? So now if we're thinking in Bayesian evidential terms, like how do we, how do we make sense of that idea that it, this fits better with Einstein's theory, Newton's theory, because we already knew, we already knew this bit of evidence but before Einstein came along. But that's just, okay, that's just a contingent, it doesn't matter, it doesn't mean it doesn't count because we already knew it. So I think what we do when we do Bayesian reasoning is we sort of, as it were, hypothetically forget that we know the evidence and we ask how likely would the evidence be on this theory, how likely would it be on this theory. And that's exactly what we're doing with fine tuning, right? You sort of hypothetically forget that the values of the const you, constants are conducive to life. And you ask, how likely would they be on cosmic purpose? How likely would they be on um, our more standard meaningless purposeless universe? Uh, so, so yeah, so I think that's, we always do that in Bayesian reasoning. It's like, yeah, I, I'm just like, think of like, a I talk about detective cases to try and make that more intuitive, like, the DNA evidence. Anyway, but so that's about the old evidence. So it's a bit technical. What was the other? Spin monism. Monism. So there are more and less extreme versions of monism. A uh, very good young panpsychist philosopher, David Buellis at Princeton. Uh, panpsychists all over the place now. It's, it, there was nobody went 10 or 50 years ago. I couldn't find. There was like one panpsychist in the country and now there's some more. Uh, it's, you know, it's not everyone, but still a, still a minority view. But the, anyway, I'm rambling. He thinks there is literally one thing. There is only one thing, the universe. And that's, that's too much for me, because like, I don't know. One's too much. No, 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 no I, surely, no, I could feel pain and not pleasure. Philip could feel pleasure, but not pain. So you need to, there's two different minds here in some sense. But anyway, uh, maybe I just haven't meditated enough or taken enough LSD or something. But so, so I'm not a monist in that sense, but a monist in the sense that there's the one fundamental thing is the whole conscious universe. Uh, but things emerge from that. Other minds, other forms of consciousness emerge from that. And I'm, I I'm more and more have a sort of very non-reductionist view of this. Um, why go for that? Well, it's just one hypothesis I take seriously, but I think it's perhaps the most simple hypothesis that can explain the reality of consciousness, the facts of natural science and cosmic purpose. You don't have to have some supernatural designer. You just have a, the conscious universe having its own goals. So, so I think that's a, a particularly parsimonious account of consciousness and fine But it's so parsimonious that it doesn't leave any room for morality, potentially. 
How Where so? does morality come from? Well, because you know so little about the conscious intentions of the purposeful being that we are. Or I mean, Christian, I'm, I'm not trying to grab, this has been a, a bit misunderstanding. I've had done a lot of interviews on this recently. I'm not trying to ground morality in cosmic purpose. Um, I think that would come up with the same difficulties of attempts to ground morality in God's commands. We get, I don't know if people know about this, the classic Euthyphro dilemma. So say God commands us not to murder. Did, did God do that because murder's bad? Or is murder bad because God commanded us not to do it? And either of those, maybe we won't go into it now, either of those seem problematic. I think you'd have the same worries grounding morality and cosmic purpose. So I, 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 th I mean, I'm, I'm an objectivist, kind of Platonist about, talk a little bit about the issue of is morality objective in the book. I do think there are facts about morality that we are aware of and it's very mysterious. And my only thing I say, I, I tentatively say is that we have a similar problem with mathematics. I think there are facts about mathematics that are independent of us and we somehow know about this eternal realm of mathematics. I think something similar about value, the position Plato had. So I think cosmic purpose involves a, consider a push towards the valuable but does not itself ground value. That was a little bit long-winded and rambling, sorry. Okay, question at the back. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, you're standing behind a pillar here, so I can't. Sure. Um, interested in the, the guy hypothesis of mm. Lovelock, uh, which seems to me, at least on possibly one level, to be um, uh, analogous to, to the cosmic psychic uh, um, theory that you're pushing forward. So if it did hold, if there was a connection, does it hold any lessons for, for proving your, your theory, the way that people try to prove the guy hypothesis? So this is a question about the Gaia hypothesis, um, James Lovelock's idea that, is, which is based on homeostasis, I believe, uh, has got parallels with your um, idea of cosmic, no, was it psycho? Was it no? Cosmopsychism. Cosmopsychism. Um, so there are parallels and wonder if there are parallels in how you ju warrant b belief in, in that which parallel the um, arguments about why the Gaia hypothesis may or may not be true. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think there certainly could potentially be connections. Maybe it's something I should have talk, dealt with in the book too late now. Um, and there has been a move from certain corners of the scientific community to challenge the reductionist story where it's just physics running the show and everything that happens in our bodies and brains is just due to the arrangements of particles or quantum chanciness or something. The, we have the assembly theory of the chemist Lee Cronin and the physicist Sarah Walker, where there is a kind of memory in, embodied in the physical world, which develops over time. I think these, this, uh, and Kevin Mitchell, neuroscientist developing a sort of commitment to, f to free will playing a role in the, in the, in the brain. So I think these, um, these scientific possibilities would gel quite well with a panpsychist or a cosmopsychist picture of things. However, when I use science in my philosophy, because I'm not a scientist, I really only appeal to pretty uncontroversial science. And I think the basic data of fine tuning, not its implications, but the basic data is pretty uncontroversial. There's some, you know, disagreement around the edges. Whereas when you're getting into the details of what, you know, homeostasis or the very specific forms of science, I, I, it's sort of above my pay grade. I, I don't want to... Nothing's above your pay grade. Well, I just, I don't, it's not my skill set, right, to uh, look at empirical data and m make a case. I'm a, I'm a philosopher, so insofar as I appeal to empirical data, I, 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 I always just appeal to pretty uncontroversial empirical data because as a philosopher my skill set is looking at the implications and making a controversial case based on the implications but <coughs> not sort of getting wading into the data because that's just not really what I'm trained for. Okay so um, as you can hear from this discussion it's a very wide-ranging book it's very accessible I strongly recommend that you read it and and possibly take issue with it as I do um, that is, <laughs> but it that's allowed. It's good philosophy because it actually allows that. It gives because it, it states things very clearly, and and allows you to engage with the arguments rather than be um, sort of beaten into a pulp by rhetoric. Um, thank you so much for the two Phillips for a really interesting conversation, and thank you for your questions and for coming today.
if, as you probably do now, want to buy the book, it's available, well, there are some here, and the majority of the copies, I believe, are at the back. If you want to take them downstairs to the second floor, Philip will sign them for you and you can pay for them there. Or just or just have a chat as well. If you don't want to buy a book, I'm happy to hang around for a bit and have a chat, like chat, talking about these things. Tell me why I'm wrong. Thank you both, by the way, for you. Ex your kind words and engagement with this. It's been it's been wonderful blessing. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm serious. You know, Philip's a real force for good in writing clearly about big questions in philosophy, whether or not you agree with him. So thank you. Thank you.